Awesome. Welcome. This is so thanks for having me, man. Excited. Thank for, yeah, thanks for being here. Um, how are you? Can't complain, man, you know, especially with, uh, I mean, the whole world, like, just in <laughs> dire need of something. Like, it, it honestly hasn't been too mad on my end. Uh, been working um, during the quarantine, which is which is great. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been a lot of uh, it's been a lot of fun. Some time to chill, um, work kind of on the reg, and kind of got a schedule going. But it's been good, man. It seems like the three D world has been super plentiful lately, and I and I, uh, yeah. in comparison to a lot of the other uh, industries, it seems like it's not going to take a dive at all. It just it's too huge at this point. For sure, especially I think when people had to make the switch, cause I originally came from the film world, uh, like we talked about before, I guess we'll get into that. But um, yeah, I think people were just looking for ways to hire people remotely. And already I was kind of remote, so I was used to the workflow. And uh, it, it's kind of crazy cause the film world really shut down. I have a lot of friends who like went unemployment and everything due to all this stuff going on. And luckily, I mean, uh, I was working for a bunch of companies that happened to even like skyrocket when everyone's just stuck at home. So, yeah. Uh, just it's kind of weird it's like the silver lining uh kind of sketchy saying like capitalizing off of people just being stuck at home but it's like kind of how it works sometimes oh for sure i mean that's that's right. primarily how some folks make their their main source of income you know definitely yeah. yeah but yeah man it's it's um it's a strange time you know it's really i mean elections crazy virus is crazy right it's, uh it's nuts out there but Let's not let's not talk politics <laughs> or, true, or true. virus, you know, or any of that right. sort of thing. Let's uh, let's let's uh, let's let this be a bit of an escape uh, uh, to all that stuff. I mean, right. So, totally. so everyone, everyone listening, our our guest is Patrick Foley. Uh, you can find him at uh, as Patrick 4 D on Instagram. Do you use any other web web presence models like Twitter or website or anything like that? Uh, mostly Instagram. I mean, like a little bit of YouTube if I'm, if I'm uploading a, uh, like a speed art video. Um, yeah. I think with like this new setup I got going on, I might try to do a little bit of streaming, um, and trying to making dailies on kind of live, almost like this, um, okay. kind of, but, uh, mostly just Instagram, a little bit of YouTube and then Skillshare for the classes. Um, but I think that's pretty much cool. Yeah. And I want to talk about Skillshare at some point yeah. as well. So as of now, uh, anybody listening, you know, you can find Patrick at, on Instagram. Um, and for those of you who haven't already been directed there, uh, I feel like I've been doing that quite a bit for the last several months. Definitely check it out. It's a really gorgeous feed, beautiful portfolio, gorgeous, like uh, array of images. It's not just the same thing over and over. Subject matter changes quite often. So, so, so again, thanks so much for taking the time today um, and to show us how you do what you do. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, we're, we are recording this conversation. I'm going to upload it to the uh, YouTube. Uh, for those of you who are unable to attend today, um, you'll be able to access this recording later. And, and I hope that you find some of it useful in one way or another. So, so yeah, so let's jump right in, man. Tell me a little bit about yourself. I mean, you seem to have this like really interesting career path with the, like the director of photography stuff and then the 3D right. stuff. So take us back as far as you'd like, like where did your interest in pursuing these creative endeavors begin? Like I know most of us, for most of us, it starts at a young age. So just right. unload, unload on us, man. Yeah, man. So <clears throat> I guess, honestly, it started, I was always trying to think of how far back it should start, but like even since a little kid, I was always kind of like the troublemaker. Uh, <laughs> I have one brother who's two years younger and he was always kind of the more reserved one kind of stayed in line stuff. I was always kind of more of the uh, one that was like breaking the rules and stuff. Um, and with that, I think came a little bit of creativity. I remember always being fascinating with like my mom's like film camera when I was like even eight or something like that. So I'd like take it and just like love the way it, like flashed and uh, it just kind of started there. And I've been super blessed to have been able to be introduced to like certain things like Photoshop, even like we had a Photoshop class in middle school which was just insane. That's rare. Um, yeah, really rare. And I, I mean, it wasn't anything crazy. It was like putting like really simple filter on like a photo, but it still is just like, you know, most kids were using like kid pics back in the day. Yeah. Um, I guess that was also one of those programs that when I was like really young, they had us mess with and I always loved that stuff um, mm -hmm. more than anything else. So, um, you know, I was introduced to like Photoshop in like middle school. And then uh, I think freshman or sophomore year high school, I think it was actually freshman year. Um, there were certain classes like digital media and like uh, 
digital video art it was called and that's where i was first introduced to stuff like a dslr camera um and yeah i just remember falling in love with that kind of stuff and i was just like i begged my mom i was like can i please get this like little Canon T3, like introductory DSLR camera. And uh, I think it was like freshman year, I started messing with that. And I was like, I was that guy in the friend group for a little bit, just following the friends around, like taking photos. We'd be going to the park playing football and like taking action shots like that. Um, so, and, so you went to school, was this in Atlanta or? No, this is Chicago, my bad, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. And yeah. so your I, school had a, like a, a pretty extensive digital media program. Right. And I mean, I did come from like a pretty conservative um, town, like in kind of the west suburbs of Chicago. So, I mean, the vast majority of people were going for like business eventually or like, you know, to be a lawyer, all that stuff, stuff mm -hmm. that their families or their parents did. And uh, I remember just kind of thinking like the, you know, the art department, they had an art department, but it was definitely like tucked away. Like it was in the basement of the school. Um, definitely less time was spent or I think less money was put into that kind of stuff, but they still had, you know, coming from a, a decent town, uh, they had you know, the resources to put some classes together. And um, I just remember, like, I remember like, especially looking back, like nobody kind of thinks that anything art related, you're gonna be making any money or you're just yeah. kind of be doing, it's like that starving artist mentality. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I even remember thinking, I was like taking all these classes, I took like history, you know, English, math, all that. And the only thing remotely I was interested in was other than PE, for sure, I loved PE. Yeah. It was like, yeah, the one that everybody loves. Um, it was like the digital video art and like making movies or like making music videos and stuff like that. Um, and so I was like, all right, even if I'm making like paycheck to paycheck, not making any money, like I'd rather be doing this than being in like some cubicle uh, my whole life. Uh, so I was kind of ready to make not that much money at all. Mm -hmm. Great for high school. Um, and that's kind of where uh, things let up. And uh, yeah. that's kind of where like the creativity, creativity kind of started, I guess. What's what exactly is it? You mentioned a specific type of camera. So I'm you're going to be hearing a lot of <laughs> me not knowing the equipment. Yeah. But. Yeah. So, so like a what kind of camera is that? Yeah. So I think it stands for digital single lens reflex. Um, and it's pretty much those actually been around stumble. Um, but yeah, as, as I don't know if you guys remember, like back in the day, like there'd be like those tiny little compact cameras that like we'd all or like our parents might have, um, which is kind yeah. of the in, in between like the old film cameras and like uh, nowadays, like these DSLRs. But what makes them really nice is that like, you know, anyone can buy them. They got like the auto settings or whatever, but especially with the Canon ones, they're really good. Uh, they shoot photos and do a little bit of video as well. And a lot of newer ones do oh. a lot of video and a little bit of photo too. So it's they're really, um, I'm actually shooting, like my webcam right now is being used, uh, it's like actually a cinema camera I'm using. I'm like linking it with this like link that connects it as a webcam, um, which is like a different story. But uh, yeah, so it's just these great cameras that, you know, really easy to use. You know, you put like an SD card in it. Um, and that's also the bridge between like, uh, of being like an introductory photographer, like a really professional photographer, like any photo professional photographer nowadays will be using like a DSLR. Okay. Best, unless I they're sticking with them. The, just just by you describing that, I'm pretty sure I know what that is. I'm pretty sure yeah. that, that, that the, the, you know, common folks would use that, you know, I just didn't realize right. what it was called. You know, I'm pretty sure my wife had a camera like that um, because she used to take, she used to do like photo shoots um, with these uh, skateboarders in, in Miami. Um, and yeah, I've just always, it's always been kind of foreign to me. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm interested in chatting with you about this is yeah. I, I, the photography world. I mean, our school had a really great, uh, art department as well. We had like yeah. a, a photo room, uh, a, a, a dark room, you know, it's really right. kind of like more high tech, I think, than, than typical public school, uh, situations. So the arts were, sure. were pushed quite a bit there as well. So I, I totally feel you on that. Um, right. so so yeah, so you had a, a strong digital foundation. Um, and yeah, as you as you mentioned, just being 12 years old, you know, 12, 13 years old, and mm -hmm. being shown how to put a filter on a photo in Photoshop. I mean, you you seem to, to have downplayed that a little bit, but that is a huge gateway. <laughs> like, I mean, if definitely, I learned definitely. to do that at such a young age, I mean, I would have probably been hooked as well. I mean, it's really simple totally. thing to do. I think yeah. the earlier folks can learn about this this stuff, I think that we could, you know people are going to continue 
learning about it earlier and earlier as the years progress. I mean, it was kind of like really edgy for our school to have a graphic design program uh, in, a, in, in the high school setting, you know, for, sure. for students to be working on Macs in 2003 was like really cutting edge, you know? Um, I remember but, that, man. Yeah, so it's like, you know, I think that, that that's, that we, we've seen that ball pushing and rolling faster than ever. And I think that's all, those yep. are all ingredients as to why this, this industry, this creative digital industry, which is still in the grand scheme of things, very much so in its infancy, has continued to evolve right. so rapidly. And, and as you mentioned with the, with the starving artist thing, that's, we're starting to see like data that's showing that that's quite the opposite now. You know, right. I think that the future is going to be, you know, parents who are encouraging their, their kids to pursue the arts as, as careers because it's become so plentiful. It's become so, so sought after. I mean, just the, the film and TV industry in, in general, just that as a small pocket is, right. is ginormous. Yeah. So, and honestly, really like, good. yeah, the, the whole concept of like the starving artists and like not being able to make money, like, it was definitely true back in the day. Like you had no bridge between like showing your artwork and your work, like in a free marketing type of way, like you have now with like social media, websites, all this stuff, like all this stuff is just completely free. Like before you had to like either know so many people, um, yeah. like have some kind of like agency repping you. Um, and just, it was, it was crazy. Like now you literally can like, click a button and like all your work is like sent to like so many people not to mention using hashtags and all that stuff yep um so but i totally see how like that that thing was it was just like generalized like the starving artist like you can't make any money doing it yeah and i think you're right i mean clearly you know the social media the internet has sped that up so fast you know i had one of my heroes actually tell me once that they had never seen an illustrator an illustrator star rise so quickly and that was such a compliment to hear from him because, you know, he had said like the client list that I had procured in just a few years took him a couple of decades to procure. And I think that that doesn't speak much to, you know, our skill level or whatever that may be, but more so just how rapid, you know, how quickly people can see your stuff now and how quickly, it can be. you know, like this guy is talking about, you know, walking up to the actual offices of Rolling Stone with his portfolio in tow and showing them actual sheets of paper, you know, this yeah. is my work. And just the, the amount of time that that must take is is, is uh, exhausting. You know, it just is much easier to reach people now, um, right. so, which is a really positive thing. So I think that, you know, if my if my mind can take us really far into the future, I would imagine that at some point creativity could maybe be automated. I wouldn't be surprised if it could be, but I don't see it being automated quicker than 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 other uh, professions that are otherwise noteworthy professions like uh the the law you know knowing the law right you know and 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 lawyers and and you know any anything that having to do i mean even surgeons are are being uh automated uh, more quickly and at a faster rate than than creativity is so i yeah. see i see a, a really big like enlightenment era and renaissance rather uh of oh. a, of, of creative uh, careers so so definitely, definitely for the, for the folks listening who, who think that we're silly, <laughs> you should definitely push this onto your friends and your and your kids, you know, especially if they're wanting to do this at such a young age, encourage it and nourish it, you know? So, right. so that's awesome. So, so high school, big deal. So uh, middle school, another big deal. You got right. super into film, music videos, making, so, so what led, where's the, the middle ground between yeah. the high school experience and then the director of photography stuff? Got it. So, uh, we're still in high school here. Um, by this time I'm trying to like capitalize a little bit on all the stuff. I'm like, all right, well, I've shot a few things. I shot like a couple free music videos for some local guys really like how the stuff's turning out. Um, made a little made a little website, uh, I think junior year high school might've been sophomore year. But uh, I got to a point where I had like maybe five music videos under my belt and like a realtor video um, mm -hmm. for like a lo local realtor. And uh, yeah, started a website, put a little like two minute compilation video of the stuff because I was like, all right, well, I can say I'm good or whatever. I can say I can do this stuff, but unless I can show people like, all right, here's what like the end product kind of looks like. They're not going to put money towards this stuff. 
Uh, so I just remember starting from the bottom. I was just like, all right, well, can you do like fifty dollars? Like just this, just like such a low amount. Um, but to me at the time, it was like a high school or fifty dollars. I'm like, oh, that's like food. That's like going to town, like getting stuff. Like yeah, with the squad. And so um, I remember just like kind of locally getting my name out, and like people started to see me as like this film guy. I was like shooting music videos. Um, and I'd be going, I'd be taking the train. I was like walking distance from the train to Chicago and be like linking up with an artist near my spot and like just walking to the train and going to the city and just like shooting these like things, just like following them around with a camera. And every kind of job I got, whether I made like a hundred bucks, 200, 50 bucks, um, I'd be putting it back into like more equipment, like lighting or like a new camera or something like that. And at the time, I mean, it really doesn't take you, you add up a couple hundred dollars, you know, $200 gigs, like you can start buying equipment. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I did. And I got it to the point where I was like, decently self-sufficient, taught myself how to edit and all that stuff, um, was taking editing classes. So I was kind of like this one-stop shop. I was like shooting the stuff. It was a lot of work. It was like full days of just like walking around with artists. A lot of times hip hop rap artists who had like, just, you know, drugs around them, even guns, like straight up. I was just like in the hood, <laughs> uh, like my career started like straight up in the hood. Um, and we were just like, I remember my mom was just like, you stop going out there. Like this is dangerous. Like yeah. can't be doing this. And she so, like, couldn't wait so, till I stopped doing all this stuff. Um, so, so clearly you were still able to do it. It's not like your folks brought yeah. you down. Were yeah. you, were you just kind of doing these things? I mean, you said you had been taking editing classes. Mm -hmm. Were you doing these things like, you know, based on what the talent wanted or were they giving you full creative freedom to make their videos or like, how, how did yeah, you, I mean, like, were you doing this kind of like, you know, okay, this shot would be really cool because X, Y, and Z or how, how did that work? Yeah. I remember like at the beginning stages, you know, when you don't have that big of a budget at all and like total budget, I'm talking like 50 to $200. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's not really that much pre-production. It was really for the most part, just like, uh, the most pre-production you'd be doing is like, oh, you got the address? All right, cool, I got this cool spot. We'll show <laughs> up. There's not that much going on. And like, you know, at the time, the people I was dealing with, they're just, they're happy with any kind of product. So I kind of had full creative control with the edit, you know, with That's each video, awesome. I was try, kind of trying new stuff, like, you know, downloading new plugins, maybe putting some glitches in there. Um, it was really just like kind of starting from the bottom um, and just working, working the way up and having creative freedom kind of helped in that sense. Definitely. It must have given you some like mass amounts of practice, like hmm. you know, just to be allowed to, to, to try and fail and experiment yeah. with different things. <clears throat> it's, it's tough when you get kind of boxed in by creative direction. So early right. on, um, so right. that's awesome. So, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. So you did that stuff. Um, and then, so at what point does the, does that, that big, that big uh, list of ad ad stuff come in? Like, at what point does Microsoft take notice? At what point does Adidas okay. take notice? Is this, is this post, is this all 3d work or is this? Yeah. So this is, this is like, like two, three years in the future. This is like, I haven't even started 3D at this point. I wasn't okay. even like entering the mind. This is, I guess we're still in high school. <clears throat> and okay, so I guess I'll transition to Atlanta. So yeah, junior high school, <clears throat> um, I'm, like I said, I'm doing a lot of rap music videos at this point, hip hop stuff. And I got hit up by a guy here uh, named Willie Hendrix, just by email, somehow found me and was like, hey, can you like fly out here and shoot a couple music videos for my artist? And um, I was like, oh my God, like new state. Like, I think at the time, maybe I went to New York a couple times and uh, Miami once, but like first time, still relatively new traveling out of the state. Um, and I was like, nice, this is awesome. Uh, would have had to skip a couple days of school though to make it happen. My mom, of course, was just like, you're not skipping school to shoot a rap music. Like that's not happening. <laughs> I was like, yeah. So I was like, okay, fair enough. Um, I'll kill two birds, one stone. I'll like visit a school out there or something. Yeah. Well, and so, it worked. She was like, okay, well, if you visit a school, like this, this is like junior year, everybody was like visiting schools. She was like, you can do it. So um, she actually came out with me uh, to visit this one school. And I actually, I was able to shoot these videos. And I remember this was like right before like all this stuff with like Migo started happening. And like all these people from Atlanta were popping off. And these guys were telling me they're like, dude, like Atlanta's going to try to be huge for this stuff. I was like, I mean, I want to move down here, but like, is the scene like big here? Am I going to get work? And they're like, dude, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. And I found that it was like, it was like even greater than Chicago, the stuff going on here. And it was less violent. There was less like the, the gang stuff going on and like the drugs, guns, all this stuff. 
the unnecessary stuff. So my mom really liked that part. And then I visited SCAD, which I, I really liked. Um, I liked the program there and I liked that I could be in uh, Atlanta, even though the Savannah campus had a bigger film program. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to be in the city. Yeah. Oh, for so sure. then I came, yeah. So then I came to Atlanta and really just kind of picked off. Like I had to kind of start over as far as like clientele, but I had those guys around me and they had a ton of friends who were making music and it was literally just like this, um, like three that just expanded. I was like, all right, these guys introduced me, these guys, these guys, all this stuff. Um, kind of like a bigger form of what happened in Chicago. Uh, and by this time I was also in school. So this is when I was trying to make the bridge between just like that one man band kind of thing, mm-hmm. be able to like direct a crew and like have a, have a role and stuff. Cause that was one of the biggest thing. I was like, all right, there's only so much one person can do. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I'm doing these music videos. It's cool, but it's like, at a certain point, if I want to make something you know, decently big or have people around me, like I got to be able to branch out. SCAD was the perfect thing um, that kind of let me branch out. Um, and, you know, I had a couple internships there and you know, learned how to produce more, learned what producing really was even. Um, and just stuff was kind of building up from there. And then midway through college is when I kind of uh, got into this 3D thing. Um, so we were taking, I remember like this editing class, SCAD and uh, in one of the computer labs, it was the only computer lab that had this program called Cinema 4D, mm-hmm. this 3D program. And uh, I remember always kind of being into it. Like I've seen a bunch of YouTube videos and just like, you know, surfing the web, but damn, this stuff looks so cool. And like abstract style looks so, um, I would do anything to be able to do that. But I think uh, I got turned off of it like pretty early on, like, I think I saw it in like senior year of high school because I just wanna, I don't think I had the, the computer specs right. And like the programs that were at least free were just like not that good yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got turned off pretty quickly. And uh, recently, or I started back up kind of sophomore year of college. I was like, well, it's in this classroom. Like there's, it's like a $3,500 program. So it's like, I can use this without having to, you know, really pay for it. Yeah. Like there's no strings attached. Um, and I remember I sat back after class the first day that I opened it up. I just made some, I didn't even know what I was doing, but I was clicking things. I was like, ooh, a sphere button. And it made a sphere and like totally was doing everything wrong. But I was like, oh, this kind of looks kind of weird, kind of cool, like really janky. But I was like, okay, let me just, I don't know why I did this, but I started like an Instagram the first day I made the first thing. <laughs> um, like I straight up and I started it and uh, I just posted the thing there. And, uh, yeah, uh, I think I did that for the next, like, cause I had class every day. Um, and I literally did that same process every single day for the next like 365 days to get for 10, maybe 360 days out of the year. Like I just one render a day, uh, of course was looking at like YouTube tutorials, like, oh, how do I do this? And each thing I'd be like, oh, well, how do I make it like shiny? How do I make it like this, blah, blah, blah. And so each render was kind of like that, you know, each shooting a music video. So like each time I was like trying something new or like, know adding something else to the workflow and mm-hmm. it just was this like hobby thing where i was like oh, i'm building a little like cool portfolio of art i'm um, doing this stuff you know so, and I was putting hashtag. so was there was so there wasn't a class like you didn't have like an instructor who taught you to do that it was more no. it's like youtube stuff so yeah so, i never had a class yeah so the program was was available you you yeah. fixated yourself to it so it sounds like when you were talking about the, your, your experience at school is that it was more just like a community thing like you had a lot you, you were able to have a larger community which helped you to create um more positive and professional relationships um yeah. that's, that seems to be a common thread um in in not only my preaching to to you know young artists or young people who want to pursue higher education Mm -hmm. um that's that's usually my main go-to is like you 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 cultivate a community of people um and i think that's super important and and so so let me ask you this so so you're you're doing these as kind of hobby things you're looking it up on youtube it seems like a reasonable thing to pursue it you're interested in it is this like so this is like uh are you leaning away from film stuff at this point? Or like, did the film stuff turn you off for some reason? And like, now you're pursuing this or is this in addition to that? Because I don't see, I mean, for all I know, you still do this, the like the music yeah. video stuff, but all for I sure. really see is the 3D renders. So it's like, right. what's what happened with that? No, so at this point, I'm, I'm still full-fledged film doing the stuff. Uh, the 3D stuff was just a hobby. I wasn't getting jobs, I was just, early kind of making this stuff I thought it was fun I was like maybe in the long term I could make like 
album covers or something trippy. Like I can see this maybe turning into like a maybe side gig. <clears throat> but I was still full fledged doing music videos, um, some commercial stuff. Um, but so yeah, I was like at this point we're like sophomore year college. I've been doing this like Instagram thing for the 3D stuff for about a year. Um, and I think I got maybe a thousand, twelve hundred followers, which at the time was like crazy. I was like, oh, this many people <laughs> just for the art account. I was like, sweet. Um, but still no jobs really. It was just like some people like, oh, it looks cool. It looks sweet. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, that was that was all the more fuel to just keep going. And um, like, oh, people think this is cool too. Like I must be doing something right. So fast forward another year, still doing the music video stuff, still doing the film stuff. Um, another year of pretty constant posting uh hashtags you can do up to 30 on instagram <clears throat> and uh little kind of hint if you do the uh or not hint a little uh, fun fact if you do uh 30 hashtags in the comments it looks much less spammy it doesn't come up with the caption but it still works as a hashtag post so that's what i was doing i was like okay nice little way i can like get this out without looking like such a spammy post um, I do that every day, cultivated like 30 different hashtags that kind of corresponded, like hashtag 3D, hashtag Cinema 40, like surrealism, all the stuff that like kind of fine tuned uh, this specific audience. And then um, a whole nother year later, so now two years doing this Instagram thing, I think I was at like maybe like 12,000 followers. And that's like a huge, it was like a snowball effect. I was like, oh wow, this stuff is. And at this point I've gotten like maybe a couple, like two, three, maybe four jobs out of this thing mm -hmm. um, that were like maybe album artworks or like uh, one or two like brands, smaller brands. Um, but I was like, oh, you know, making money doing this, like, you know, um, and for the money, it was like actually kind of more than I was charging for the, uh, <laughs> the music video stuff. I'm involved at least because there would be some jobs, I mean, once I got like pretty fast at this stuff, like I, mean, I could make something in a three to four hour span sometimes mm -hmm. um, and be charging, you know, enough to, enough that it would be like a music video, you know, on the side or something. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, this, I feel like I'm onto something here. If, you know, I spend much less time making more money doing this stuff, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit less people can kind of wield a, or kind of make stuff like this and like wheel the camera and move it around like that. Yeah. Um, I was just trying to look at it from a, like a supply and demand perspective. So I was like, at this point, this is where I was starting like <clears throat> film on a little bit less, 3D a little bit more. So stuff was starting to kind of meet in the middle a little bit. I think I was still doing a little bit more film. And then yeah, fast forward a year later, um, like, where was I? I think so, I, I started doing it sophomore year. Sophomore year was the uh, when I began the first three, um, and then year later, year and then year later senior. So two years into it, I was like a senior in college when I had like twelve thousand followers or whatever. Mm -hmm. and stuff was starting to come in the middle. <clears throat> and then a year later, or actually kind of like right when I graduated, this is where everything was literally like, I'm talking fifty fifty. Like I was getting like fifty percent like music video commercial stuff, fifty percent three D stuff. So like. At this point, I mean, I was looking at this 3D thing as like, yeah, this is by this point, I was doing some Skillshare stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, that was already like a back backbone kind of residual income thing. And um, yeah, it was like 50 50. And I remember that once I graduated, stuff just started going a little bit more towards the 3D. Um, because that was just more of a thing where I was like, I was still posting every day. There was no stop in the influx of followers and like, the way I see it, the amount of followers corresponds to like a percentage of the people of them, they're going to be hitting me up for work. Mm -hmm. um, and I could, for the first time, s literally kind of see visually that this was kind of promising, like, especially being a freelancer, it's always just like, oh, when am I going to get my next job? But this was like kind of like a bright, you know, a bright passageway into like being able to see, all right, well, this is probably going to lead to more things if like more people keep seeing this work. Mm -hmm. So that's what gave me kind of like the, uh, the drive to keep this going. Um, focus a little bit less on film and just go with the 3D stuff. Um, and then it was just like, you know, each year later, I was getting like 10, 20,000 more followers or potential clients, and I was just getting more work. Um, and this is when I started telling people, like, if you were to ask me, I was like, half the people I was telling them I was a 3D artist, half of them I was telling them 
was a director or director of photography. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just totally came down to who was asking me and who I was talking to. And I think like at this point, I mean, I've been doing this stuff four years now. Yeah. And almost everyone other than just like music artists, even the music artists, cause I, you know, if they need like artwork or stuff like that, I'll tell them, but um, I'm usually saying three. That's awesome, man. I mean, and, yeah. and at several points, you mentioned a few things that I was just completely, and I still am completely unfamiliar with regarding Instagram, you know, putting the hashtags in the comments section. And are all these things just like small things that you picked up along the way? Cause like, I imagine that, that a, a successful, you know, social media page or, or account, you know, has engaging content, which you have, but also has someone wielding that engaging content that understands the mechanism of the of the platform. So like, was right. that just something that you read up on, you know, like are what are some I remember actually maybe a year ish or a couple of years ago, I had I was up really late, my wife and I went to a concert and we were home at like three in the morning. Nice. And I shared a I shared an image on my Instagram and you commented on it saying like, good job on the 3 a.m. post or something like that. They said yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. And you said something like that, like, good job. Um, you compliment. And, and I had no idea what you meant. I was like, what is he talking about? Like, I'm not doing something on purpose. And then I read about it. And apparently, if, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like a good thing to post in the middle of the night, like early in the morning ish. Or is that something I, I made think that might have something to do with the like your demographic or something, uh, depending on where they're all based out of and when they're all online. I think I was just like, Oh, I think I was up at 3 a.m. once in saw and I was like, oh, props at 3 a.m., like posting at 3 a.m. I don't think it had anything to do with like <laughs> that, but I was just like, oh, he's posting at 3 a.m. What's up? He's also up. Um, oh, he, must be, he must be partying. He must be having right. a good time. He must be still partying for life. Um, <laughs> so, so that's not, okay. So what are some of the, uh, of the, the, you know, the tools of the trade? Is that, I was actually talking to um, a buddy of mine about social media and he was asking me questions. He's like, what do you do for your social media? And I was like, yeah. I don't know what you mean. I just post images. <laughs> and he just, I think he was coming more from the perspective of like, what's your strategy or, mm -hmm. or um, you know, if there is one. So do you have that? Or is that something, is that something you picked up on? Or sure. like, and um, as your following starts to grow, yeah. you start to pay attention to that, right? Yeah, for sure. So I think uh, to answer the very first point, um, you know, where I learned about like the hashtags, all this stuff, um, I, it really came down to it was kind of just like slowly learning some on my own and some by other people in the same boat other 3d people because uh, i would notice i was posting these hashtags i'd put like 30 after my caption like in my post and i was like all right this looks like really like i don't know this is like cool content but it's starting to look spammy with all the you know it's getting the word out there but i'm being able to see everyone can just see all these hashtags that doesn't really look that professional um and so I remember, uh, I don't remember if the first time I saw it was like someone else who did it or if I was like, well, did it work? Like not in the post, but I may have tried it um, just to see, cause I would click on, by this time I was getting like a decent buzz around some of the work. So if I did click a hashtag, it would pop up usually. Um, so I just tested it in the comments and it worked. So I was like, okay, this is much better than putting it in the post. So they kind of get hidden away by other comments. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw other people doing that as well, you know, and that's the thing, you know, taking inspiration from other artists around you. And, you mm -hmm. know, I remember using some of the similar hashtags that some other artists at the time were using and um, kind of just like taking, picking and choosing, curating your own kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I don't even, th I don't think for the most part, I was like reading up too much on the social media. I just remember kind of being involved in this when all this stuff was pretty new, like, I know I remember Facebook bought out Instagram um, and with that, all these like insights and analytics came a thing um, because I think midway through, I converted my Instagram to a business account. And that's when you can start seeing all of your like numbers and who follows you, where their location is, yep. uh, their age range. Um, and that's only like the tip of the iceberg because once you know all that stuff and you decide to make like an ad or something, you can throw anywhere from like a dollar to like, you know, a million dollars into like an ad that will go anywhere and you can kind of fine tune the demographic because you already know you know, the kind of people that are following you. Um, I think like my top locations are like LA, London, and like, you know, certain places in like India and stuff, but it's just crazy. Um, you, you expect like all these people to be from like Atlanta or the, the place you are. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's just giving me good insight into where this stuff is like really popular and like kind of headed and <clears throat> stuff like yeah. that. 
So, so Adidas, Microsoft, Reebok, Crocs, Acer, all super yeah. notable clientele. I mean, sure. it's a fantastic client list. Um, so Thank you, man. did you get <clears throat> on their radar via your social media presence? You know, like did that? Yes, for sure. So yeah, and that's still how it is nowadays. Um, right. A lot of times right. nowadays, what will happen is um, a lot of times, like with the really big clients, I won't sometimes work directly with them. It'll be through a third party agency. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes it is though. So like um, if they do reach out, there'll be some rep from their company that'll hit me up on my email, which is connected to my Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and they'll be like, saw your stuff, which is another really cool thing about like getting your work from Instagram and like people seeing your work because even to this day, whether it's Crocs or like all the big guys, I almost never have to branch out for my style. It's always they're hitting me up for like the style. And I remember you talking about that too, like this, the work you do with the illustration, it's like all catered to like your style because people hit up you for like, you know, your type of work. Yep. Um, and so it's, I just thought it was really cool. Like you think with like these big companies, like I remember it was so funny. Like you think a company like Crocs, it's like, okay, well, you know, they got to make sure the thing is like absolutely flawless, like 50 million revisions, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. They, I remember them being like, we want like five different illustrations. Um, you pick the ideas, just like send like a brief idea of like what each one will be. I remember just sending them five things. They're like, perfect. No revision, <laughs> whipped, them, whipped them all up and literally none of them had a revision on any of them. And I was just like, all right, cool. Dream job. Um, <clears throat> literally the dream job. And I was just like, you got to be, I mean, I have, I have them here actually, if you want to see a couple of them. That'd be great, um, man. Cause I can just, uh, I pulled up a couple things. I was going to go to this, but yeah, I gave you the, uh, I gave you the, I edited this thing so that you could uh, share your screen at any time. Cool. I'm actually, I'm through this thing. I'm going through like a streaming software. So I don't even have to actually, if I just go to like, left. There we go. Yeah, so if you're going to like uh, pulled up like a couple references, this was like the first thing I did for like Crocs. Oh, um, so they were, I remember them coming to me just like, all right, so we got this new product called like the Reviva or the Reviva like flip flop. <clears throat> and we oh, want to like illustrate. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, and we want to we want to illustrate that it's like really soft and like all this stuff. So like in your kind of style, can you like? I remember that was their big thing. Like, can you do this in your style? Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, hmm, what if like bunch of gummy bears like that would feel really squishy and soft and they're like sweet and so i just whipped this up and they're like sweet <clears throat> so this was like on there this is like for their instagram and stuff so, um, at the time. so you don't you don't do like um uh, <laughs> like sketches or anything like that you just like like when you work with these or maybe maybe it's different across the board but yeah. with crocs you just worked up the final and you were like hey this is it uh, no, well, yeah, sometimes it's like, you know, the kind of middle ground or sketch, I would say, is like the wire filling, wireframe. So like before texturing and lighting, lighting, I'll like send them kind of that. Okay. You still have to do a little bit of the backbone work, but you don't have to like light texture and give them the final before. And when you talk uh, about the wire, you're talking about like those, those process shots that I see you share on Instagram where it's like the gray. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Definitely. And let me see if I have... Uh, All the way up um so like the wireframe being like yeah so like okay. for this shot it would be this is what i would show like my hand maybe that would be like final mm -hmm. after texturing but yeah i mean that was and the second one was this the uh that's gorgeous man. um so just like showing that it's like airy light floating all that stuff so just like illustrating different Big thing here was just showing the different senses of how it would be really airy and light. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that was, uh, that you, was that one. <clears throat> you, you achieved it, man. And I mean, it's, it's Thank working, you. working with big brands like that. I mean, the payouts are so much better than, oh, yeah. than, than editorial. Um, although I, and I, I feel like I've maybe told you this in the past, but have you ever submitted or considered submitting your stuff to to mags like your stuff would kill in the editorial world like specifically yeah. your conceptual work like the croc stuff like hmm. um the kind of ideas that you have um like that stuff would would slay like that's new york times new yorker rolling right. stone like that's they eat, eat that stuff up i think that primarily 
one of the reasons it would be so special in that that industry, that avenue of the industry, is because it's not the most common. It may be the most right. common, um, like you know, your 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 style fits within a style family. I think in the three three D world. But typically, mm -hmm. even now in 2020, the most commonly, you know, used illustration in, in magazines is like drawing based or collage based or 2D based. Right. So I think your stuff would stick out like a sore thumb, but like in a positive way in editorial. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah Definitely. Like, I guess yeah. I just don't know the, uh, like, I just have would have no idea how to even dive into that industry or whatever, how that even works. Yeah. I mean, it seems like, it seems like, you know, with your, with your 3D stuff, for, for these ad companies, which by the way, is is the golden gem to me. It's like, I feel like right. so many illustrators that I know who are editorial, who love doing it, have dreams of working with big companies like Chanel and stuff, you know, like uh, yeah. the payouts are just huge, man. Like you can make, you can make a year's salary in, in one or two projects with these, with these folks. Um, right. To, to do things that, like you said, take you very little time to do. And then that gives you so much more of a cushion to, to, to exist and not worry about, right. especially in the freelance world. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the way I've always seen it done, man, is like, you know, for what's happening with you is that they're coming to you on your Instagram page, which is great. I right. think that, that for editorial, it would happen similarly um, in addition to sending out mailers and, and, and mm. competitions and art books and shooting emails and you know i mean if you were just you know look up the email of you know art director uh for new york times or something uh, right. and find them on linkedin or find them on instagram and shoot them an email of just like five to ten images of your conceptual stuff i would not be surprised if they responded to you really like, yeah like if, if we nice. We have a story that's in line with with that we think your your stuff would work with. We'll contact you, and they'll contact you, like 100. Like your work is at that is at that level. Um, Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, and your client list is, is spectacular. Like you could destroy the editorial market. It's just not. I guess it's not like super worth pursuing if it's if it's not already your bread and butter. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that industry is more like 750 to three grand for interiors. But your stuff is also cover stuff. Like, I mean, just that croc yeah. stuff, it's like the cover of a magazine. So I right. mean, covers, I, I mean, are anywhere between 4,500, 6,500, maybe more, you know, depending on, on how much they're willing to, to, to how much uh, they're willing to put into you specifically. They may sacrifice right. some of their interiors for lesser known artists or, or artists who are willing to work less, unfortunately, in order to get you to do like a big cover or something like that or a big gotcha. story. So, wow. So, so you're you're typically so with with Crocs, you were dealing with like a an art director or a creative team. Like, do you have to get these these designs and these illustrations approved by just one person or by like a bunch of different people? Uh, it depends. Um, like this one, the Crocs one specifically. I think I was dealing with like a third party agency, um, and that was pretty chill. That was like pretty back and forth. I was just dealing with one guy, mm -hmm. um, and I think he was going back and forth from Crocs or something. Mm -hmm. um stuff like reebok that's definitely more of a like a bigger scale thing um that was like i was working with third party agency but within that agency there was like six to eight people on the thing and then they were dealing with like six to eight people on like reebok side and it was just like so much back and forth like that was like a full day like or like 30 days thing where i was like on zoom like slack you know like all this stuff um and so that was that was definitely a different type of uh beats whereas like the crocs thing was more just like it was just me you know feeding the ideas here one and done kind of deal which i really like i, I kind of like that workflow oh it's awesome i mean it's, yeah. it's really i'm always interested to hear everybody's experience with the ad world um sure it's hard for me to find a commonality you know i mean if you if you could provide us with this information what would you say is the is the medium turnaround time you know that all of these companies have in common with your experience working with them like are you you know you mentioned 30 days you know a month in just the the preparation and the, the back and forth um right with, uh, with reebok and you mentioned a quick turnaround time with crocs like what's what's yeah. been your quickest turnaround time and your slowest turnaround time quickest had to have been the crocs one honestly between i mean really any job <clears throat> that I've had um, slowest 
want to say in some jobs like they'll they won't take me that long but the current like they will give me like almost a month sometimes yeah. like they'll okay. give me a longer time uh and then the reebok one was just constant work for a decent period of time like at least a month or two um that one they're they're all i guess different i, I keep referencing like these shoe companies these are just the yeah, ones yeah. that are popping out yeah yeah um and then of course you got the ones in the in the middle like i, I would say there's no unfortunately no commonality between like these turnarounds like and a lot of times i'd say 50 percent of the time they're asking me when i can get my stuff done and less about this is the deadline okay, okay. Um, yeah so a lot of times it'll be because a lot of these people don't even know how long this stuff takes like this like even if this takes four or five hours to me like some of these people legitimately think it takes like weeks mm -hmm. um which is good it gives me like cushion and obviously i'm not gonna be like all right i'll get it to you in a week or two weeks if it takes four hours yeah um but i do remember with the with the crocs one it was like yeah um i remember i finished so soon <clears throat> but i didn't want to like <laughs> necessarily reveal that i was like all right done like because then they, i was just like oh what if they just you know like well, why are you charging all this money if it only takes this long <laughs> well, i took the gamble i was like well i finished early here's the here's the stuff and it was like the best case scenario they were literally like wow you got all this done like can you make like five more <laughs> they literally they were they added more to the to the job with like a bigger pay i was like yeah for sure like if that's, that's not we're like much. we're blown away by like how fast like this was made like this is perfect and i was like sweet that was like the opposite of what i thought you guys were gonna say oh and that and, that, and uh, that's a general fear you know that's a fear of mine yeah. it, it's a fear for me as well with an editorial you know i don't want mm -hmm. to show all of my cards so quickly you know but in some cases as you mentioned it's seen as right. something to be celebrated you know, so I think, sure. they're, and one of the reasons I asked too is, you know, I have students who are willing to, to completely write off a certain aspect of, of, of an industry just because of time. You know, like right. I have students who like the idea of editorial, but, but then it takes them a month to finish a piece. And it's like, well, clearly you can't live in that world. And you have the skill set of being able to do something quickly. You know, it seems right. like you can get something done within hours, which is, to me, a skill set. That's something to be used, used, uh, can right. be useful. You know, and and in a, in a pinch, you know, some of these companies are going to remember that. Like, Let's get Foley to do it. You know, he can do it really sure. quickly, and so that makes uh -huh. you valuable. So, so that's awesome, man. So, you know, self-taught. I love hearing that. You know, I love. You know, it's not something that I think is is something that that you can see as a negative thing regarding higher education. I think that self-taught just means you're motivated. Clearly your higher ed provided you a community with people that were really useful to you, you know? So with that said, man, like I'd, I, we'd really love to see you start something for us. And, and for sure, and we, definitely. Can, we can just keep talking, you know, as you bring one of these things. Yeah, and definitely. Yeah, so super pumped to, to watch you work. At this point for each of these renders, I'm using a D, like I'm using, on my tablet, ZBrush, which looks like this, Cinema, and then I'll be using Substance Painter, which is the program down here, for texture stuff. So Cinema is kind of like Photoshop in a sense where it like does everything decently well. Um, but like, you know, you'd go to Illustrator if you want like purely vectorized stuff or making logos versus like, that's why you'd go to ZBrush if you're really gonna hone in on the model and like sculpting stuff. Like I wouldn't sculpt in Cinema. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of industry standard for sculpting and then substance is standard for texturing then bring it all together in cinema Ford. <clears throat> okay yeah so at this point it's that's why these things are taking it's almost sucks because like each render used to take like an hour max now they could take like four hours sometimes for like these dailies so okay. green left this is <clears throat> cinema with like a blank plate here and i'm thinking i like this like this kind of glass material, I guess. Make... <clears throat> I haven't talked this much in a while. I like, of... <laughs> yeah, it's it's weird. It's weird when when you you start to work while you know, and you you feel like you have to talk while you're working. It's still something that I'm still right. trying to <clears throat> figure out because you're not usually talking while you're working. <laughs> I mean, well, I even can't. I like can't imagine even being like a professor, like. You guys have to talk all the time in class like i'm i'm like my voice is like almost hurting i'm like oh. i know i always have to get used to it or big water bottle i think you do i think you do a little bit i think that you know there's this kind of like freedom in being a student where right. 
where you can just kind of sit there and if you want to zone sure. out you can zone out you know and it's sometimes a healthy thing to zone out um right. but as an instructor you can't really zone out you have to just kind of be leading the whole thing so it's it's, it's one of those things where I think maybe you can get you can get used to it after a while but it for me personally it's a little exhausting um right. to, to always be you know at the helm of something but it's a it's at the same time somewhat of a rush so it's 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 positive and and uh, and negative in, in in a sense but um but yeah, yeah demoing it, it depends on what I'm demoing but um it, it, sometimes I'll just stop talking <laughs> and, right. while, while I'm demoing and I feel like that's fine you know it's it's good to have some for sure some uh blank space from from time to time you know so for those right. of you for those of you listening or just tuning in it's Patrick Foley he's about to do a really cool uh demo in Cinema 4D uh and uh for those of you who don't know he refers to himself as a 3D generalist um, and uh, makes these gorgeous images um, that can fit in many different avenues of the industry. Um, and, and 3D art is, is, is on the rise. Uh, and, and, you know, there's lots of really cool folks that I've been seeing doing really great things uh, with, uh, with uh, 3D sculpting. There's a, a studio in, in Berlin called Zeitgeist. Um, and they, they work with, uh, you know, like Absolute and MTV and they're, they do these kind of like surrealist, you know, 3D stuff. And they're really interesting to look at. I definitely check out Zeitgeist for those of you who don't know. Um, and the attention to detail that they put into their projects is amazing. And um, there's also uh, this really cool 3D artist named Letitia Ronaldo. Um, and she's actually, she started out as a designer. She's actually from Brazil. She lives in LA and she does 3D stuff now. Um, and just, she basically focuses more on like modeling and texturing uh, characters uh, within a, you know, a bunch of different scenarios and backdrops and things like that. Um, and then, you know, you have, there's another, uh, this other guy that I follow on Behance uh, named Pedro Conti. Uh, he's also, I believe, a Brazilian uh, 3D artist, um, and he's worked with, with Philips and Chanel, and he's done stuff for short movies, like short films, and um, has a ton of, of 3D work that, that you all should definitely check out as well. Um, I think he's worked uh, on the set of like Game of Thrones, Great Expectations, uh, I think one of the Sherlock Holmes films, amazing portfolio. It's just really expansive opportunities you can have with the, the 3D world beyond just making references, obviously. Um, so for my research, it looks like there's a ton of 3D artists who don't necessarily ride solo, um, but are instead like a part of a studio. You know, like Zeitgeist is a, is a studio full of artists. So folks like John Ree from the Stryker Digital Studio in Prague, you know, they're, they're amazing studio they're kind of just like and that's something that i've talked to my students about too like the the idea of you know the folks that you meet in college um those those could be folks that you start a studio with you know you can share totally. and, and is that something you've done have you done that or you just just have always kind of flown solo on this stuff no i mean that's <clears throat> especially in the film world the people i met in uh college totally like i've gotten like so many gigs i was always the guy that was like you know i knew some people from like the fashion marketing department painting drawing. like i was always kind of like diving in on uh just different i was almost like i was just like floating around like during in the hub <clears throat> you remember the hub right yeah but like yeah i would just like know all these random people from different stuff like even meeting some people at like parties or something um and like some people probably saw that as annoying, but um, I think it's really just comes down to, yeah, like if you're just like always talking to people, like if they need someone and they know you do this, like you're gonna be the first person they think. It really doesn't, I know artists tend to be kind of closed off and like, you know, sheltered. Um, and I think that's such a bad or an unfortunate kind of way to go, especially being in art school where like all these people are gonna be like freelancers and starting their own business. Um, yeah. I've done shoots for like people doing startups. I've done like, just all these people are going to be not only your friends, but like. Yeah, you know, you never seem that way to me. Um, and I think that, right. that you felt almost kind of like an anomaly in that sense. You know, the, the majority of folks that I know 
in illustration are introverted people, but, and, and that's one of the skill sets that it's really difficult to teach that, you know, I mean, you can say it until you're blue in the face, like go hang out with people, <laughs> you know, go, yeah. go have a good time. Like it really weirds me out when, when uh, I just don't, you know, I, I ask students about their weekend and it doesn't seem like they went to a party. It doesn't seem like they hung out, <laughs> you know, like it doesn't seem like they got in any trouble at all, you know, and that that's, <laughs> And although I'm not encouraging that, you know, entirely, it's like, it's good to get you some knee scrapes, you know, every now and then yeah. and to, and to like, uh, mix with other people and to make sure that you're not just spending too much time alone is all I'm saying, you know? Um, but like, yeah. So, I mean, for those of you listening, you know, I, and I had spoken about this briefly to some of my students recently, like when you graduate, like the people that you graduate with, you have the potential of, of starting together where you can like have you know rent a studio space together rent, you know buy equipment together um and then you'll realize that these things are don't aren't so expensive when there's seven other people who are throwing in for it you know right. like scanners and cutting boards and all this ma materials that really eat up an illustrator's funds at the start of their career it shouldn't have to be that way um and and one of the ways that you can do that is by starting a studio and lots of folks do it you know um like that, uh, that the Peter Kolis, who works at a Polish production studio called Ari Thania, you know, um, it, wow. it, uh, it's it's you have a, a huge mix of artists, uh, and what that does, and what that's going to do, probably, is eliminate the rep. And I feel like social media, as as Patrick has already suggested, in many ways has eliminated the rep. Um, you know, artists are going solo. They don't need agencies to to help them get work anymore. Um, and and that's kind of cool in a way, you know, and, and I think the same is happening in the music industry as well, um, where, you know, these big record labels are, are almost like becoming obsolete in a sense, you know, where the artists are having uh -huh. more, more control over their content and, and, and more power to them, you know, and it say you you know for example if Patrick and I had our had our own studio with four other artists you know and and a client comes to me wanting 3D work and I say I don't do 3D work but I have somebody in the studio who does that then all of a sudden you know you're passing on work to the people in your studio and you right. know an army of, of five or seven people in, in a in a in an apartment or in a housing situation is much stronger than an army of one um, for for all the reasons that I've just stated so. Um, highly recommend that for those of you who are trying to pursue creative careers in a in a more cost effective fashion. So, so um, tell me what your work. Tell me what it is you're doing right now. <laughs> right now, I'm crafting a coffee mug from scratch, starting with the, the basic wireframe. Yeah. Now, rooting out the uh, this guy right here. So I'm kind of like metrically this in a sense. Um, but uh, yeah, essentially you start with um, kind of a basic wireframe here. And I guess the name of the game, especially if you're going to be animating, is make these things with as little amount of polygons as possible. Okay. Because the more polygons you have, you know, the more taxing will be on your computer. Now for an illustration of almost any kind, it's not going to matter, especially coffee mug. You could really just make this terribly, essentially be fine as far as the computer handles it. Mm -hmm. But um yeah, so essentially we're just like kind of dragging these things here. You can be a bit rough with it. Um, and again, I'm not trying to too much time. Maybe making everything. Part, it but seems like you brought that together really quickly. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, I mean, uh, not too bad. So essentially, I'm trying to get as close as I can to meet these guys together. Now you see we've got a little bit of a problem I'm trying to bridge these two together. So, mm -hmm. guys. So in awesome. my in my mind, so again, since I'm not familiar with this this program at all, um, to me it's like really impressive that you've put this together so quickly. So right. it, you're gonna have to explain to me, like, is this what you're doing right now? What you have on the screen, is this something that a beginner would be able to do as quickly as you've done, or would this? Yeah, I would say like a a really you know if you just start doing this stuff. Uh, no, I would say if you are a beginner, you probably would learn to model something like a coffee cup first. Um, this would be like a great beginner exercise. Okay. Another reason why I thought this would be one. Cause it's like really simple shape. It's a cylinder. 
Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if you noticed, there's obviously there's like a line here, mm -hmm. called like a loop. And um, clearly there's like a big space here and then another one. Another. Um, essentially this thing looks like this, almost looks like low poly, like old school cartoon. Yeah. Um, it could be done already if you were in like an old school video game. Um, but we'd want, what we'd want to do is put like a modifier called like a vision surface um, attached to it. So what you would do is drag this underneath, watch what happens. Now it gets moved out and it kind of, judging by the Polished. edge loops here, um, it'll smooth out the point. So you can see if I want something to be much tighter around the edge, then I would bring this guy closer to the edge and you can see if I bring this really close that's like a really tight loop yeah if I were to bring this down you can ha have full control over like level um so if you want to make like a coffee mug it would probably be something like that. um <clears throat> and so just like making these things from scratch it's almost a little bit of like tedious homework making sure you know where to put the edge loops because it's not just kind of like blindly making it mm -hmm. and just stuff like that so now it just comes down to tweaking the Man, is there a such thing as visual ASMR? Because you just adjusting those <laughs> was really satisfying. Oh, really? Yeah. Man. Oh, maybe I should start a maybe I should start a TikTok or something for it. Yeah, man. Like you pulling up to, to crisp out those edges was just really. It's like one of those like super satisfying visual videos. <laughs> Dude, I love ASMR. You were actually the one who recommended to me uh, the genre of music called lo-fi. You still work to that? Oh yes. Dude, I'm pretty sure I have a tab open. My favorite, right here, this thing. Coffee Shop Radio 24-7 Lo-Fi. Can oh. you hear this if I play this? Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's like kind of coming in and out. It's a little choppy. Got when, it, I, got when, it. I, when I edit this later, I'll, I'll definitely toss on some of this in the backdrop. Yeah, no worries. That's, uh, uh, that's such a good go-to. Yeah, it's really like soothing, super soothing. The thing about like the live playlist is that they never end, so they never like loop there, so they're it's flowing. So now what I'm doing is I'm kind of just like really just eyeing this, rounding it off so it doesn't get like pinched at certain points. And yeah, a lot of it is just kind of like I what you think it looks for. I'm rotating, scaling based on the thickness of guys are and uh pretty good and i think one of the see look thank you up here um but hmm. i would also refer to you as a 3d concept artist um God. like i mean that's one of the avenues of the 3d world and i think that it makes sense with what you do as well like in addition to the you know the 3d generalist uh, title or moniker that you go under um totally. you know like the 3d concept artists you know they create uh, illustrations to sort of convey ideas for you know video games, movies, ad companies, comic books, animation, um, and right. other types of media. You know, like they, you know, um, you know, typical concept artists rely on you know sketches, whereas people like you would rely on 3D renders and and 3D graphics to visualize ideas and create you know artwork for visual environments. Sure. Characters. Um, so I mean, I think that that's you know. That's that's definitely another way to refer to this as. Definitely. Um, yeah. So I think so. What I'm doing now is uh, it's crazy. Like the way we make this, it sounds so kind of like simplistic, but sometimes that's the best way to go. So right now I'm making the uh, the liquid, which will be splashing out, all starting oh, okay. from a cylinder. Believe it or not. Okay. So yeah. So essentially, what I'm moving now is the what will be the liquid. And this is a really sweet technique um, that I uh, started doing um, kind of by accident one time. Whereas usually I think if you would ask a um, a 3D artist how I would have done like the splashes in midair, they'd be like, oh, he's probably running like a simulation, <clears throat> uh, like a fluid simulation that like collides with stuff and all that stuff. There's actually zero simulation and zero dynamics. And pretty clearly, um, they're pretty honestly, there's no collisions either. So it's, it's all like the illusion of being like splashed without actually doing it. Interesting. Which, which I'll show you is like a much, um, 
better way to do this specifically. Um, and it only works for still images because it's not going to animate. Um, but you get so much more control over what it looks like and where it is. And that's kind of the beauty of it. So let me see here. So I'm going to create a general shape here and maybe bevel this out like that. <clears throat> now this would be probably the most low poly drink of all time if I said I was like finished here. But um, so what we're going to do is put this whole thing and we can title this liquid. And this will be like mug up in the layers. We're going to throw this whole thing into a is it volume builder, which as you can see has turned it into this weird mess. Mm -hmm. um, these these are called voxels, so it's essentially showing you like a 3D volume and these boxes kind of correspond to like, I guess the resolution of the thing. Mm -hmm. And so this is like a preview. So if I were to render this, um, nothing would show up. So I have to throw this whole thing into a volume mesher. And now it's geometry. So now it looks a little bit, um, you can see before, this is what our geometry looks like. After, this is what our geometry looks like. And this is good because this allows us to um, have other objects intersect and become part of that geometry. So if I were to turn this off and grab like a sphere and bring it on here and be like, okay, now these two things are attached. Clearly they're not, they're just like intersecting. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to just like bring this up and down, um, but if I were to turn these guys back on and throw this guy into the hierarchy and now drag this on top, we can see that it's uh. actually, yeah, it's actually like intersecting with this thing and becoming part of one geometry. That's, and that's going to come. Yeah. That's going to come really handy soon. So <clears throat> what we're going to do actually is actually, I think I'm going to keep that for now. Um, I'm just going to add on to the shape. So we want this thing to be like exploding. Mm-hmm. And what I'll do is if I turn both these off so we can see what's actually going on, I'm going to bump up the segments, which corresponds to the resolution of this sphere. So you can get really high. So it's like essentially smooth. Um, so I'll go to something like 60, maybe <clears throat> 60 segments and drop an effector underneath it. So we have a bunch of effectors here that do different things. Uh, this one's called the displacer. So I'll drag this on top of the sphere and nothing happens because we have to tell it what to do. So Essentially, we have it set to changing the height of this thing by 10 centimeters, <clears throat> but we have to tell it how to change the height. So we're going to use shading and use a black and white noise to deform it. So we can see now just by changing this height and like really morph out this sphere in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and all this stuff is non-destructive. So if I turn the stuff back on, I can still mess with the displacer. Um, but it's being, it's all being done underneath all this. So it's still being acted as one geometry, one piece of geometry, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of cool. Still kind of looks weird. Um, so what we got to do is usually if we have like a bunch of splashing stuff going on, there's like, it's not just like a blob of liquid. It's like there's holes in it and it's like splashing everywhere. So to do that, we're going to go back into the volume builder and we're going to go volume type to fog. Um, <clears throat> And then we're going to go, and I know a lot of this stuff probably makes zero sense to everyone watching this. So I'm probably, I'm just going to kind of explain it, but for the most part, just chug through. Yeah, no worries, man. Go, chug, chug through. I mean, this yeah. just, just watching somebody work in this program is, is illuminating. You know, I think, that, sure. you know, right now this, what this serves as is, is a gateway. I mean, we don't have these, um, I like, we don't teach these classes in, illust in the illustration portion of the graphic design department. Right. I don't think the graphic design teaches this either. So it's just, yeah. it's already, I think what this is doing is just making us interested in this. So Definitely. yeah, like well, that's totally. rifle, rifle through this, enjoy yourself. And I'm, I'm thoroughly interested. Yeah. Chat as much as you'd like. I <clears throat> appreciate it. Yeah. So essentially I just threw on a shader field into this whole mix, which is a different type of object. And essentially this is going to allow us plug in a similar type of noise as we did in the displacer, but affect everything. And instead of the noise affecting the um, the height, it's going to affect the kind of intrusions of the object and like the holes and like sucking things away. So now if I choose a similar noise, you'll see that this thing kind of has somewhat holes, but it's not really, it's kind of hard to see. But what I'll do is go back into the noise. And if I change the high and low clip, you can see, uh. yeah. 
and more so if I change the scale. So this scale is pretty low, so it's hard to see stuff. So if I go to like 500, and maybe 800, you can see now. Yeah. We're actually getting like eaten away at this liquid. So kind of looks like it's exploding places, not really yet. Um, so now it comes down to modifying this and trying to make at least what we have here look somewhat like liquid. And um, what we want to do is boost the resolution a little bit because we're still like, we don't want to be able to see like these massive shapes. It just confines us. Um, so we're going to do is take the volume builder and the lower the voxel size, the higher the resolution. So we'll go to like five centimeters. See how that works. Sometimes you got to redo it. So it loads. All right. So that's a higher resolution there. You can see. Um, and then usually what I'll do is um, throw in a smoothing deformer over the whole thing. So if I put this in here, it gets a little bit smoother so I can smooth like this whole thing. Um, so it's just adding levels of control to this whole thing. Um, Man, essentially. This program, so. this program is insane. This is insane. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff um, for sure. So what I'm going to do is keep messing with this noise. What I'm going to change the type of noise. What's up? What, what did you say the cost was for this program? Um, they actually relatively recently started doing a subscription, but uh, when I bought it, it was like 3,500 um, bucks. Uh, but I think you can get it now for like 60 bucks a month. Okay. Which clearly isn't that bad compared to 3,500 bucks. Especially like, if it's just buying it out. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, if you're making money doing this and I remember one guy explained it so well to me and I was like, dude, why is this so expensive? And he's like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, Paying thirty five hundred dollars to literally make anything you could visually see or think of, like that's not that much. I'm like, well, I guess you're right when you put it like that. Um, but yeah, totally to like certain programs, it is like definitely an arm and a leg. So I'm gonna take the shader, go to the noise, and not only do we have this one basic noise we've been messing with, we click this guy. We have all these different procedural noises which won't lose resolution as you get bigger or smaller. So we could choose something like this guy. Um, and kind of lower this clip. Um, and also you can lower the high clip and see what that does. We're kind of eating away at certain points, this thing and all this stuff. I don't know if you see these like circles next to every value. These are all keyframeable or keyframeable. Yeah. So, you know, if I were to set this thing here and then set this guy, make it low and it would be just animating. So you could essentially animate certain things like that if you really wanted to. But I'm going to get rid of this. Cool. So I'm just going to change this noise till I find something that I'm happy with. And um, let's go. I like that. So high clip down maybe and adjusting the smoothing a little bit. And then you have this other parameter, which essentially just like fattens everything up if you want. Um, but it's finding the good balance between the resolution, the noise, because clearly this stuff is a little bit too hard edged for us still, still looking a little bit weird. So let's see. Okay, maybe something like this. So it seems like a lot of what you're doing right now are like, like preset options. And then once you get it, is it like, once you get it to a point where you're like, okay, this looks relatively what I like, what I need for this. Mm -hmm. Do you then manually go into it like you did with the mug and, and start skewing specific areas or? Yeah. So the cool thing about this is um, when you say preset, it, it's almost, uh, I think the right term would be like procedural. So it's like just these, these values that will allow you to um, kind of change all these like noise parameters. Everything's based in like a noise format and you can also upload just like I'm doing with this stuff. Um, instead of using a noise, I could upload like an image. If I had like a, any kind of image, I could like essentially base this structure off of like an image that I upload. Um, but this makes it really nice because 
you get so many more parameters you can change <clears throat> being at pre being at uh being procedural and all that um and then let's see if we just upload if we change the seed this is just randomizing the noise so if you're not happy with like you're like oh splash looks kind of cool so far uh but not exactly what i'm going for let's see it's kind of cool um so i guess this will be a decent point to kind of stop and see if we can So, boom. Yeah, that looks great. Appreciate it, man. Um, okay, so what we'll do now is we're gonna take this further and make it more kind of malleable and be able to do whatever with it. So what I'm gonna do now <clears throat> is go from like a side angle maybe and uh, literally draw with a spline. This is where it gets really cool. So literally if I just go, I could just sketch this actually, if I just go, all right, I want the shape to generally be like oh, over here. And maybe over here, not splashing out this way. No way. And maybe just like over here. And then one kind of going out there. So it's like, cool. That's like uh, this like 2D spline, whatever. Looks kind of cool. <clears throat> what we can do is hop this spline into and underneath the shader. Oh, that's and, insane. <laughs> yeah. And so what we can do is because it's still being affected by everything, um, we still have to put this underneath the shader in here. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to up, up the density here and up the radius. Whoa. Yeah. Um, and so far that looks a little bit cartoony, but that's because it's not being affected by this noise. So if I drag it under, you can see uh, yeah. Yeah, that we still have like the same controls um, that we need as far as uh, bending the spline. So if I were to take one of these splines and move it, man the possibilities are endless right and you can how start you, to see like the how crazy do how do you finish anything <laughs> i know it's it's that's that's tough um so you can see you have all these same parameters you have the smoothing this would be if the liquid was maybe more of like a fizzy drink maybe or something um so maybe something <clears throat> leave it like that and it's hard to say because when you're looking at these things in this clay mode like they all just look hard so you're like oh yeah. that doesn't really look liquid but you really have to wait till you're looking <clears throat> through the lens of like the render mm -hmm. so i think that'll be good uh to start out with we have like our basic shape <clears throat> and then what we can do is create a camera camera button and this is where like my film work kind of ties into this stuff <clears throat> you can see here then the object you got the focal length um, you got like your depth of field, f-stop, all this stuff, your coordinates. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is zero everything out. And the Z, I'll take like maybe like minus 650 um, because we want to actually see the object not be inside of it. And then if I hop in the camera, this is what we're looking at. But what we want to do is probably group this whole thing and rotate it 90 degrees. And I'm going to usually what makes objects look better is if you're not so wide. So like if I was like using like a wide angle lens and went all the way up here, you can see how much this is like deforming the mug <clears throat> and that's not that appealing. Yeah. So the same things apply in real life. If I just zoom back and go to something like uh, an 80 millimeter, it just, it kind of proportions things a little bit better and you're actually not getting warping here. I actually made the, the mug to be that shape kind of here so it almost looks like it's being warped but that's kind of the shape we just went with and usually what i'll do is uh i guess i'll leave it up to you should we put it on like a platform or should we just have it in midair kind of exploding uh hmm. midair wait oh the water so is this is this the kind of stuff you do on uh on skillshare yeah just stuff like this um and i think the the kind of arc I have versus other stuff is a lot of tutorials and classes will be like, all right, here's how to model this, or here's how to texture this. Whereas I kind of like, here's how to make this from scratch mm -hmm. in a way, you know, in a kind of unorthodox way sometimes. I think people like to see the process, even when I don't even know what I'm making that much, they can kind of see like, oh, this didn't work. Let me try this. So, uh, so if my students <clears throat> wanted to find you on Skillshare, how would they do that? Uh, there's a link in my bio, which will give them like two months free, which I can also send you actually. Um, 
great. And like a special link. And um, yeah, and it's just, and I give you a Skillshare. It's uh, Patrick 4D, I think it's under. Um, but yeah, the link is in my bio on Instagram. Um, and I can just send you that as well. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is, so everything's positioned here. Everything looks good. <clears throat> I think we'll have this just, uh, maybe we'll prop the camera up a little bit. Right now we're just, we're not actually changing the, we're just changing the angle of the camera. That looks kind of cool. And we'll take this group, just call it drink. And we'll maybe rotate it like that, something like this. You see our bounding box here. Usually I bump everything in like a square format. So this is easier to see. Um, and so something like that, maybe we can rotate it a little bit, depending on where we want that handle, I guess. Yeah, maybe something like that. <clears throat> and then uh, now it comes down to, I usually light my things before texturing. So, I mean, the textures only do so well if you see the right lighting conditions, right? So um, what I'm going to do is change i usually have like different like usually i'm using like two or three screens for this and i'm trying to compress all this in one so what i'll do is go to octane five year window so this screen will be where it renders <clears throat> and you'll be able to see like the preview so i'll drag that right here and let's see octane settings let me just set up some parameters real quick And we'll need the node editor. All right, so if I were to render <clears throat> this right now with a, we had a HDR environment. If I were to render this right now, this is what we're looking at. And it's completely black because we have zero light source, zero everything. Um, so we need to add a light. And um, one of the ways to do that is just going to adding an area light. And you can see if I were to rotate, uh, first things first, actually, I'm going to lock this camera. So if I move, it's not going to move with me. Um, and so what I'm going to do is up out of the camera. I can see what's going on here. We have the camera here and the drink there. And so I'll take this light that I just made, rotate it, drag it up. That's awesome. That's and so you can see all this stuff technically, and this is where, again, <clears throat> lighting things in the real world really helps with this. So if I move, notice the shadows that are moving with it. <clears throat> yeah. And you can see just like, you can really craft your own scene and portray like the mood you're trying to, you know, portray just by moving certain lights around, you know, mm -hmm. basic things stay true like in real life. So if I have a uh, really big light with a low intensity, so if I drag this like really huge and drag the intensity down, the shadows are really soft yep. versus if I were to have this be like tiny and really bump it up, like the shadows are all like super harsh. Um, so it's just like things in real life. If you're trying to make things look more grungy or add like a smaller light kind of farther away versus um, a much more peaceful, calm, like light like this, um, with like a warmer tone or something like that. So it's just all about like portraying the stuff that you want to portray. So um, I'm trying to think how I want to set this up. So we'll do, uh, we'll create this slide. This will be like a nice like overhead light. I usually have one of them in my scenes. Um, this, and actually before I show you that, a big thing <clears throat> and a huge way of lighting 3D scenes, um, there's a term called HDRI. So what that means is pretty much taking a 360 degree photo. Let me see if I can load one up. It'll load. So we'll go 
So I have a ton of these photos. I'm gonna try and see if I can get you a view that you can see. It's hard to see these. I wonder if there's a way to, uh, oh, aren't you? There we go. So I don't know if you can see all these, but these are like 360 degree photos of real situations. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them I took, some of them you find online, some of them you buy or whatever. But um, essentially, <clears throat> and this is really going to blow your mind, you can wrap these images around the scene, which essentially fits them in there. And not only will that light them with the light values, but it'll reflect the actual reflection. So if you make these things you know, reflective, they reflect real life. And that's how you, part of the reason you get really realistic reflection. So if I were to place this image as the HDRI, you can see wow. I move around the actual lighting changes. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so a way to see that is if I go and grab a material, let's say just a metallic, like pure chrome and put it on the liquid. Now, if I were to rotate this, it's, you know, it's essentially if this thing was purely chrome reflecting all of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> and likewise, if I were to make it specular or a, like a glass material, it's reflecting or it's like refracting the light so it's like bending the light and you can see behind it yeah. um and that's how that kind of stuff works so i think i'll change the uh hdri to something usually i use both area lights and like an hdri so usually i'll change it to like a uh something like a hdri studio setup give us a nice little let's see, foundation there um and then i'll turn on like an area light uh, but I won't want that in the shot, obviously. So um, you can still have it lighted, but just change the opacity to zero. And then what I'll do is actually create another sky environment, um, but change this to a color, but use as visible environment. So it's using the last, it's using this image to wrap around it, but we won't see that image. So if I wanted to just make it black, you can do that, <clears throat> or any color for that matter. Um, so now we got stuff exploding here. We got like a, a decent lighting situation here. And uh, this is kind of a close up of what it looks like so far. And uh, what we can do now is we're trying to make this material this is where we can go back and so I guess kind of like a cloudy material. Kind of like that. Um, and we'll see how much we dive into the, into the texture because we're only using cinema. We're not going to use like these other programs, but um, we'll try to make something that looks somewhat decent. So what I'll do is I'll just like have these open over here in the side. I don't think of which one looks best or which one's the least edited. So maybe something like this. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to delete the uh, this material. Oops delete this uh, specular material. Now we're not getting anything. And then uh, we're going to create, this is where we got to use the node editor. So this guy right here. Um, this is where like most people will see this and be like, all right, this looks complicated, but it's actually not that bad. So we're going to create a composite material. Um, and essentially this has created a new material for us and we can drag that onto the liquid. And Essentially, this is saying we can like combine three materials to make this complex material. And so we can grab, grab a sub material and drag this as the first material. We can see, like, very basically put, if we drag this to red, the whole thing is going to be red. Um, and if we made another one, dragged it as our second material and made that white. White. Um, just adjusting the mask of material two, you can kind of switch, you know, this is a very basic gradient between the two. Um, so that's just a way you can kind of like combine material. So, but I think we'll just focus on the first one for now. So we're going to be going, changing the material type to specular. And this is essentially where we, we were at last time. So we're going to go here and, uh, 
just change a couple parameters here to make sure this uh, kind of speculative material or coffee material looks realistic. And now this is where it gets uh, pretty cool. So we're going to take a scattering medium here. Um, and there's a term in 3D called subsurface scattering, and that's where um, it's like a pretty complex material where like, have you ever seen like a candle when light hits it? It's not necessarily like you can see inside the candle, but you can see light radiating inside. Yeah. Um, that's scattering. So essentially we're recreating that look um, with this. So we're going to take a RGB spectrum, which is just a color, another fancy name for a color. We're going to make it white. Um, and then we're going to take a float was just a, is literally a fancy way of saying a value between zero and one <clears throat> and dragging that on the scattering. Now for the first time you can see, um, here, let's see if I can change this to like red, something like that. You can see, um, based on adjusting the float is just pure glass or just zero kind of scattering. Um, this is like jello or something like that. Whereas if I were to drag this here starting to get like this and you can see it more if I were to take this value down the density let me see if I can over this so now you can see in the yeah. more populated areas we're getting like a harsher red and in like the really small areas we're getting like a faint color um, and that's kind of like how to just one of those ways to boost the realism if we increase this um, we're kind of increasing like the fogginess or haziness inside so um, if we go to a color like what we're trying to go for, you can just take the color drop. And uh, apparently that isn't strong enough. So we would just decrease the value here and decrease this stuff. And let's see. Also, that's about fine tuning like these kind of values to get. And this is a very dark value for this kind of work. So um, usually you would never want to bring this this low. It's only because I color dropped this. So if I bring this up. And let's see. This really hazy again. Because essentially, I don't think this liquid is really see through. There's just so much fogginess to it. So we're going to change this to make it a little bit more that orangey texture <clears throat> and then we're also going to take a transmission a color for the transmission We're getting a decent color, probably add a little bit more of that orange, orangey, or maybe yellow here and a little bit more color in the transmission. Starting to look a little bit more like it. And just messing with uh, you know all these values to really fine tune it's it's really just like a you know it's like anything else just like you know now we see here we get like in the really small values we're getting like this like light upy thing but in like the dark values almost no light passes through um at least according to these photos So I think the key here is to try to get some of that decent value between this here, the darker, which I think we're starting to finally get. <clears throat> Still to me looking like, almost like a orange drink that's exploding. And um, <clears throat> other thing we haven't talked about yet is just like the glossiness. So the roughness we call it here. So like. Everything is 100% glossy, which is like what we want for liquid. But if we wanted this to be like matte, we would just drag this all the way 
it's another thing is like almost like a matted texture like a like a waxy candle right so if we were making some kind of candle that would be kind of more of what we wanted but i think for this we strictly want liquid which is cool um let's see see what else we need to do to this thing Just boosting this a little bit. And maybe even changing the texture of the thing too. Like maybe there could be more. I feel like the way it's breaking off is not necessarily how. Um I think we can decrease the resolution actually. Um let's see. Is this noise? And we go peak. Smooth it a little bit more. And of course, messing with the seed even of this animation can like do wonders sometimes, just like literally, you know, it's a whole new render just by changing the seed. Oh, okay, and this is what you were doing earlier before you had the kind of color palette happening. Yeah, so it's kind of cool to go back to this once you have everything almost set up and just see how the light reacts to everything and just see what other formations you can come up with. That's great that you could still use that feature at this point. Right, everything completely is just like totally non-destructive, which is just great, which is always preferable. Really, and I feel like any artistic sense, you always want to be able to go back and work on stuff. Um, which is cool. And I just realized I should probably save this while we're working on it. In five. Let's go. Let's see, uh, spice, latte. Wait, is latte two teas? I want to. I think it's, I feel, <laughs> I think it's two T's. Yeah, that, that's how you know we're artistic. Yeah, I think it's two T's. Okay, sweet. It sounds too fancy to not have two T's. Let's put it that way. Right. All right, so yeah, we're doing, uh, we got this thing going on. Let's see, um, working on this texture. And this is where we can actually introduce the next material, I think, uh, because we got some like kind of gradients of like different fluctuations of materials in there. I think that would be probably good to have reflecting in the render. So what we'll do is grab this material. And remember, we really haven't even worked on the second part of the material. Uh, so if I were to take this mask and bring it back, or wait, sorry, we go to the material to mask, we can still fluctuate between coffee and just redness. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do is actually just literally duplicate this material. Let's see. Put it into material two. So now we're kind of going between both of the same materials. So essentially if I were to change this mask, nothing changes because they're the same. And uh, I guess what we can do is slightly darken this one. Like that, maybe. And then the mask essentially is just like, what do we want to take away versus show? Um, we could use something like a noise. So again, another procedural noise here, which looks like this. We drag this over here. Um, actually, I think before, yeah, let me drag that into the mask. And it might be pretty faint to tell, at least to begin with, so I'll boost the contrast to see if we can actually make out some of this stuff. Yeah, I think we can see a little bit of it, like right here. Um, and if you, I believe if you solo this, you can see how the noise is affecting everything. Um, I'm gonna draw that up. So <clears throat> what I can do is change the projection of the noise 
so it's not just being stretched really weirdly. And then move everything so it's easy to see. And if I change this from mesh to box, now you can see that this noise is being kind of like evenly distributed throughout um, this whole shape. And now you'll see if I disable the solo mode, you might be able to see, yeah, you can see some fluctuations. Definitely adds the realism a little bit. So what I can do is change the contrast of this thing and change kind of how dynamic this noise is. Also being able to change the type of noise too helps. I think we can stay like that for now. So if we increase the contrast like that, I think that should be good. And now I think we just need to kind of uh, meet in the middle with this texture. So we can create some lighter values here. Let's see. So if we wanted to get like a really extreme example, you can see um, we're getting a crazy mask here. So I don't want that much, but a little bit of that might help. So can you tell with like the compression, like the difference in values here, or is it pretty hard to tell? No, I'm seeing it. I think it's also because I'm, you're announcing that it's going to happen. And so I'm paying attention to those areas. And oh, yeah. As soon as they're affected, I, I can see the difference. For sure. Okay, cool. So it just adds another layer of just like, just so it's not so simplistic. So we had a little bit of stuff going on here. Um, and then what we can do again, let me see textures. I mean, we even have some like, light spots and like some grain here. So I think that can be our third material, which is great about this whole type of material being like this composite. You're not just dealing with one material. So I think if we literally, um, and I believe you can actually do more, you can, I don't know how many, yeah, you can have as many materials as you want in there. Um, so I think we're gonna stick with three for now. So we're gonna go, this is the mask for number two. And let's go. I mean, you can see already, like if you were to just show someone even this, they're gonna be like, I have no idea what's going on. And that's how I was too when I first like kind of using this stuff. Like it just looks like a damn science experiment. Um, it looks like circuit boards with little wires on them. And right. I never right. thought that that's how your stuff looked, you know, in this program. I've, I'm only mm -hmm. seeing the final. So this is really interesting. Totally. Um, so I think what we can do is. Yeah, we can just duplicate this guy again. Add that to material three. And see what that has done. Really looks delicious, man. It's like, it feels like, yeah, like, yeah. like thick caramel. Right. So or essentially we'll bump this up. What's up? I was gonna say, or caramel. I don't know. I know some. Oh yeah. Right. Caramel. Definitely. Whatever it may be. Let's see. Let's go to material three, the blend. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So now we're going to take, we're going to duplicate this noise, but we're going to have to uh, pretty severely change the parameters. And this is why you can see it's hard doing all this in one window. Usually this is like a second, this whole thing is a second window. I'm going to move. This guy, the mask. And so clearly that is looking very dirty, which we don't want. We're just gonna get like little specs. And I think we'll be able to do that just by ending a couple things here. I go back to solo. You can see the, uh, the dark areas are I believe where we're getting the show through. Or is it reversed? Um, No, the white areas, I'm sorry, are the areas where this material is showing through. So what we want to do is increase the contrast, um, increase the gamma. Now you can see we're getting like kind of specks of dirt almost. 
And then we'll want to take this down. And let's see. These are like kind of little specs. Increasing. And I'm talking these are, I mean, if you look at this, these are like tiny little specs. So we really don't want to go too crazy with this stuff, maybe just decreasing this. Um, and now if we reveal it and see, hopefully little specks of stuff in there, very slightly. But we might want to populate that with more of them. Like that. And if you hold down all, you can really fine tune these values. You can see like it almost looks like grains of bits of stuff in there kind of similar to this stuff here yeah like the inner workings of the coffee itself like right. fluid flowing within fluid that's interesting right um and i think honestly if we really want to take it to another level we'll add one more material to kind of add this whatever this like cloudy white stuff is oh, um like like uh, parts from the foam or something that right I right and these are the kind of things like you're not going to notice this in coffee unless you like have to build it and that's why like it's just like after doing this for so long you kind of see these things in just like a different light you're like oh well, i gotta make this this that whereas they're like oh you just made the brown liquid i thought you were done yeah like yeah. that's the kind of stuff that really takes it into like <clears throat> the next level of realism um we're gonna go back in here and what also makes this stuff just like even more like a damn science experience so we're gonna go or materials um and we're gonna yeah i think we're just gonna increase just gonna duplicate this stuff and it's cool that you can kind of work off the stuff you already had um i'm gonna tag this on to material four get a mask there but you can see it's starting to get more and more intimidating but you've seen how this is like you know brought about now it's mostly just like kind of repeating things and it's not too bad so remember the white stuff shows. So if I go solo, we're going to try to emulate this kind of material texture thingy. So I'm guessing we're going to have to step this stuff up. We're going to go take the contrast down a little bit. See if there's any other type of, I think Perlin might still be the way. Um, You can also, you don't have to stick to this ratio. This is kind of uniformly changing it. These things almost look kind of stretched. So you can always stretch these things out a little bit if needed. I know, especially people who work with Photoshop, you never want to, it's always like, you're just like scarred anytime you see someone stretching an image yeah. in a way that you're not supposed to. So it's like, you, sometimes you got to get over that. Um, because things in life aren't always necessarily Gonna turn out perfect. Um, we can see how this looks. Um, and again, we have to change this material um, to something like a milky white, almost. It's hard to see what's showing sometimes, so. Let's see. That's looking great. I sure, appreciate that. Let's see here. So I believe on material one. Okay, so. We'll make this material like a really crazy metallic material just so we can really see where this is showing because sometimes it gets really hard when you're messing with all these different things okay now we can see 
And I mean, you can even see even this like weird example, you, like you can make like a half Chrome, half copy, like you can do anything in this, you know, program. All right, maybe tone this down a little bit. Now go back to this specular shape. Yeah, these like final adjustments are always like the most finicky, like. Oh, we're getting there. Amanda girl's really trucking along here. <laughs> props, props to Amanda for sure. Especially yeah. she doesn't know anything about what this, what's going on here. <laughs> so I think, I mean, you know, we could go forever to make this thing uh, kind of as janked up as possible. And, you know, now that we have this going on, we can pretty clearly see, um, you know, if we, Increase that. You can kind of really fine tune maybe a tiny bit of that stuff showing up. Like little streams. And I think what you can do actually is um, if you embed this into the well, I guess that wouldn't really make sense, but if you embed it into the bump, theoretically, these should be raised now ever so slightly. So if I were to put this input into the bump for all these materials, Be great to see a 3D render of just what that looks like. It reminds me of like GarageBand or like Pro Tools, like when folks make music, like just that little that little. Oh, this? <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, yeah. You're plugging like the inputs into the, yeah. the interface and all that stuff. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought at first too. That would be a cool like art piece, like a 3D render of these like battery looking things. And that's actually yeah. And like the title could be coffee mug. You know what I mean? Like. Definitely. Uh, because that's like what it is, you know, just that's that's what that looks like uh, in order to make what you just made. That's right. Cool. Definitely. Totally. Um, actually, a really good idea. I never even thought of them. Yeah, those, I love the, all those little mechanisms about, you know, these programs, you know, it just. Yeah. It's been so long looking at these items, you know, but no one ever sees the, the kind of beauty and excitement of that little circuit board. Only you do. So it's right. just kind of like it's really cool to see that. For sure. Um, so a really easy way to now, I'm gonna take take away this node editor. You can see, I don't know if you can tell, but these stripes now are like extruded just slightly off of the surface. Yeah. Um, and it's just like such a subtle thing, but you know, I think it works. So 
we have this like pretty complex um, pumpkin spice latte material here. Um, and I forgot, we can just texture. And this makes the texturing of the mug very easy. We, all we have to do is just go to a simple glossy. Um, and now this thing's kind of reflecting as it should. You could add like subtle cracks. So if I wanted to go into the material and this part's really cool. This is where you can really get your mind spinning on how much you can do. Obviously the diffuse corresponds to the colors of so black, it'd be a black mug. But um, for now we can go white. And like we did before, now instead of putting like a noise or something, um, like we were talking about procedure earlier, you can upload any image you want into this. So if I were to go over here and upload the image of, let me go over here. Extra large. It's gonna be hard to find this. Um, I got a lot of like texture photos of like random stuff. Um, but one in particular, I'm looking for like this cracked. There's someone, but that wasn't one. Um, just to speed this up, we'll just go. All right, let's just say you got this picture right here of like cracks. Um, which I remember, I remember I took this and just like, this was like an actual image I took and I just like color selected the cracks in one of these photos and just replicated the cracks on Photoshop. So if I were to take that and put that into the bump, um, so at this point we're no longer affecting the, we're not affecting the color or the glossiness. It's purely the bump. So the surface texture of the thing, um, what we can do, put this into the bump. And you can see there's like subtle imperfections of the crack and you can see here it's stretching. So we don't want that. So let's go to projection and transform. Let's go to box. And sometimes I like to just, instead of wrapping around, I can just click mirror. So it just mirrors it a little bit more seamless. We can drag this up a little bit to something like that. Now we have some like pretty subtle scratches and we can take this down if we take the power to like 0.5 we can have some kind of natural looking or maybe even 0.25 yeah. now we're getting some natural just like tiny little imperfections that um most people probably won't see but if you like really look closely if you're printing it too mm -hmm. uh, you know it'd really show so um if you want to do like a quick uh whipped cream kind of how that would look exploding all we got to do is we can take what we already have this thing and literally duplicate. Um, I'm going to call this let's see, latte and then duplicate that whole thing, that whole structure, and then call that whipped cream. Now, I would just take, I think for the whipped cream, we can just go simple. We don't have to make a composite. We can just go back to the material, drag this on there. Um, and literally change the shader field here. Um, so it'll kind of morph around what we already have just a little bit. And maybe let's see what else we can do. Um, doesn't have to be quite as much of it. I guess we can start there, but, um, now if we change the specular um, oddly enough, you you make a uh, whipped cream from like a glass material, at least how I would make it. So you'd go to the node editor and it's just a lot of scattering. So um, I think what I'll do is just go to medium scattering. It's terrible. And uh, we're going to go drag this to the absorption, make it a white. We're back to where we started essentially, and then going to a float again, which will be a value between zero and one for the scattering. Now we can see we're getting kind of like this, um, just a little bit of scattering. Um, maybe take this back a little bit, increase the, uh, the float. 
but we want light to be like entering through there. So that's a fine. And then we just combine this with a, uh, a white material. So if we just make this a universal, take the metallic down and take the albedo down. So zero value here will get you this like material we just made and a, now we just kind of go until this looks kind of like whipped cream, at least for the texture. So now this looks like really melted whipped cream. It's kind of mixing around with everything. Um, and I think probably we don't want this to be as melted so we can decrease the smoothness. And let's say, yeah, so now it just comes down to kind of mixing these kind of values here and seeing what we can get as far as this stuff looking like it actually exploded from this stuff. Maybe increase the resolution of it. Gotcha. And then we can actually go into the shader Shader field and start messing with these. Now we're actually gonna, I mean, it almost looks like it's like an infused, like these things are kind of uh, exploding together in a weird way. And of course, if we took out the spline, we wouldn't have any of the stuff there. Uh, and we can just kind of morph if we wanted to move this. Remember this original sphere we made? Yeah. So now we can kind of move that anywhere we want if we wanted to take the displacer and instead of it being, I don't know if you remember, like this like really pointy object. Um, I'm increasing this noise. Uh, maybe like 100. And something like that. So maybe something like that, who knows. And then just kind of dialing these things back. So it's almost like you're crafting, like if you could kind of like freeze time in real life and just do what you wanted with these material materials, that's kind of almost like what we're doing. And then now it just comes back to the post-processing. Like I'm, I'm pretty happy where this stuff looks now. Looks pretty cool. Good. Um, now we can take the camera and put an Octane camera tag. <clears throat> What I'm rendering this through is actually a third party plugin called Octane, which is uh, for rendering and texturing, but it's all within cinema. <clears throat> so I'm going to turn this guy on, change a few parameters. Um, and you could do some pretty cool things here. Like uh, this is where you would adjust like the exposure of the image. Once it's already done, you could add like a glow if you wanted. So you could add like glow coming off of these things. If you add like a cutoff, Add like uh, some nice shimmering stuff coming off of these guys. And even stuff like spectral intensity, which essentially is like a film burn. If you were to like see these edges here now. Yeah. Almost just like, you know, it's like light bleeding through like the lens or something like that. So even just like little stuff like this adds like some character and like realism to the actual uh, object, so we don't have to go that crazy with it, but and add some glow. Looks like coffee in a Daft Punk video. Right, exactly. And then, uh, yeah, so then it even comes down to stuff like depth of field. Like if we know that we're gonna be, if we know that like we're super close to this stuff, we were to take this uh, new camera and kind of zoom all up in here. We knew we were pretty damn close to this thing. What we could do is enable depth of field now you can see, we go like 20, you can kind of see the uh, effect there. So if I zoom way in, you can kind of see that the background is like super out of focus. Yeah. And then uh, the stuff we're looking at is not. So that depends on how close you are to the object. If you want to portray being like super far away from it or super close to it, actually. 
you want to go like underneath the thing and the thing was like bursting in the sky something like that or just go with like this simple composition like we had here so um that's for the most part it then it just comes down to rendering this thing out placing it how you want it to place you can like you know do whatever put this in any kind of position that you wanted and then uh, usually i'll bump these guys out and like mess with it on photoshop too um and really kind of bring the colors to life in that regard but um for the most part that is actually it that's beautiful man you'll have to send me that definitely we will do that's cool. sure so yeah this is awesome this was really cool to watch you work man i i had never really seen a uh, a process like this before um, for sure and and uh i mean i've seen bits and pieces on youtube but like not like all the way through walk through like that especially from your right so yeah man this is great i mean I, I think that you know for those who end up watching this later um i guess we didn't have like the biggest turnout today but i think that's probably you know the folks are you know anxious you know the election corona all that stuff I think the one of the last things some students want right now is a another Zoom session. You know they've been having all week these uh, Zoom. Yeah. But I do I do think that that those who end up watching this later are going to take quite a bit from from your little presentation and demo here, man. So for sure, I really appreciate you uh, to lending us your time. Um, so just to kind of close, I mean, I think it's pretty evident that in the past several years, you know, we've seen a huge rise in when it comes to interest in 3D modeling. Um, especially with, uh, you know, 3D printers and virtual reality, you know, like they're they're really allowing us to interact with 3D designs in a really kind of new and, and unique way, you know, and I think that they're useful in a variety of industries, you know, like architecture, construction, toys, for sure. Uh, we had Richard Goodwin uh, chat with us about that uh, in the last talk that we did. And I mean, you know, virtual reality in general, you know, really allows us to experience these 3D designs in the full round, you know, an interior, interior folks, they can create a virtual walkthrough, um, which I've been doing now. And, you know, their clients can sort of like take a look at, you know, every inch of the room before, you know, even any remodeling or modeling takes place. So all these new technologies, you know, they've had a huge impact on the entire field of 3D design. And they've made it evident that 3D artists serve an essential purpose, you know, like, and I think that that's a, one of those kind of myths that I've been hearing, you know, it's like, what are you going to do with your 3D degree? You know, it's like, it's very clear that without 3D folks, we wouldn't have all of these insanely awesome Marvel movies and the best right. dragons you ever saw on Game of Thrones, you know, and, and video games like Fortnite. So it's clear that, you know, there isn't you know, a field where a 3D artist wouldn't be helpful. You know, and this is exactly why I think the 3D market is growing and why it's going to continue to grow. So this is really good news for 3D artists. You know, there should be plenty of job opportunities for y'all in the coming years. Those of you who are interested, especially in movies and video games. And so, man, an immense thanks to you, Patrick, for you know lending us your time and knowledge today. Your your demo was fantastic to watch and talking for to sure. you was a lot of fun, man. So I wish you nothing but the best. Uh, please stay in touch and stay safe, you know, and I'll let you know when the, the full video is up for viewing. Definitely, man, please. And let me know. Um, I just actually saw Amanda said something probably a long time ago. She said, <laughs> you said a quick question at any point, there's time. What is the main advantages of advantage of using ZBrush over any 3D modeling programs like Blender? Um, and she's still on, maybe I'll just answer it. Uh, so essentially, uh, from what I understand, and I've never actually used Blender, but um, I know it's gotten much better over the years. Uh, ZBrush has, I think just like any other program, like, you know, if a program can only do one thing um, really well, or that's its main purpose, you're gonna have just like more tools and more things at your disposal. For instance, like if I go to this tablet real quick and I'm sculpting something um, with like a brush here, I'm like building out all this stuff. At least in Cinema 4D, you would not wanna do this. Um, because as you can see, the more I build out on this thing, if I go up here, you can see the geometry gets super sloppy and there's no easy way to clean that up. But in uh, ZBrush, there's this really awesome feature called DynaMesh. And let me know if there's something in Blender that can do this, because I, I don't think so, but I don't know. Um, but if you were gonna do this, you'd want to clean up this geometry and I can't keep, keep building off of this if I wanted to extend this because the geometry is just getting so small. So all I do is 
um, control swipe and watch what happens to the geometry. It like remeshes itself, which is like super important if you want to like keep building on. And uh, if I run into this shape here and remesh, it becomes one object. So like we just, it's just so much easier to like kind of build off of stuff, like make things organically um, using a program like this. And then you would bump this out to something like cinema. So I don't know if ZBrush or if, um, what do you call it? Uh, Blender has those functionalities, but I can tell you ZBrush is pretty industry standard for like the modeling stuff and uh, sculpting stuff. So that is the answer to that question. Um, and the second I was, the second thing I was gonna say, if you want me to slap like a uh, logo of the school on the mug or something, feel free to send me that logo. I can do that as well before I bump this out. Oh, that'd be great, man. Yeah, I'll shoot you an email with that. Yeah, for sure. Again, I wish you nothing but the best. Let's stay in touch, all right? Definitely, appreciate it, man, you too. Hope uh, everything goes well. And uh, just keep going on. Hope uh, the success comes and everything. And uh, thank you to Amanda for sticking through. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'll send, you, I'll send you that logo right now. Cool. Sounds good, man. Later.